Philemon, verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This New Testament book, Philemon, fits on one side of a page in the Bible. It's a very short letter, and at first glance, you know, you'd look at this letter, which is a personal letter from Paul to a good Christian friend of his, Philemon, and you might think to yourself, what's this have to do with me? What's this have to do with the church of God? How did this get into the Bible, this personal letter? Is it useful to us at all? I ask that question that way because it's kind of ironic that actually Onesimus actually means useful (laughs) in the English language. And Paul actually makes a play on words, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But let me share with you briefly a little bit about the context in which this letter was written. There was this house church in Colossae that was actually the house and the home of Philemon and his family. Philemon had come to the faith in Christ Jesus through the work of Paul. They became very close friends. Philemon, like other Roman citizens, had a slave, a slave by the name of Onesimus. And Onesimus was uh, one day ran away. Now, he must have known and heard about Paul's house arrest in Rome because he ends up connecting with Paul once he gets there. And we know that probably Onesimus had to at least take some food with him and maybe some resources to make that journey from Colossa to Rome. And so he probably would have stolen some things to make that happen. While with the apostle Paul, the gospel is shared with Onesimus. And in the sharing of that gospel, the Holy Spirit works in the heart of Onesimus and brings him to faith in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. And Paul becomes very close to him, actually calling and referring to himself as a spiritual father, as though he is a father-son relationship, because now he's an old man, at least in his eyes. Eventually, Paul encourages Onesimus to return to his master, Philemon, Only he said that he would send him with a letter, pleading that his master wouldn't do as the law requires. The focus of the letter is this pleading of Paul to Philemon to take Onesimus back, not as a slave, but now as one who has come to faith in Jesus Christ, just like they had, that he could be a brother to him. And so Paul strongly encourages in this letter that we just heard, we heard the entire book of Philemon here just a moment ago, to take him back as a, not as a slave but as a brother. And he doesn't demand this of Philemon, although in the letter, if you watch, there's a couple of places where he says, I could tell you that this is what you're going to do. By the law of Christ Jesus and what you and I know about Jesus Christ and his love for us, you need to do this. He doesn't do that. He gives him opportunity. He's appealing to him. He's strongly encouraging him to choose to do the right thing and not take him back as a slave, but take him back as a brother in Christ. Paul surely has in mind that Philemon will receive Onesimus back just because of where they are in relationship now with their Lord. And this is exactly the reason that this letter is very useful to us as we study this Word and as we hear this Word speak to our hearts and our minds. In many ways, we are all like Onesimus, and Paul is like a picture of Jesus standing between slave and master. Let me explain. You see, in our sin, we are like runaway slaves. In fact, we read in Romans chapter 6 and in other places of Scripture that we are slaves of sin. 
Jesus said in John 8, 34, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. And we know that this began in the garden with Adam and Eve as they ran away from God, going their own way, disobeying Him. And when they fell into sin, they became slaves of sin. And they would receive the punishment that they deserved in pain and toil and in death itself, just as God had promised. We can already see also in this letter something historical that is happening in the culture of Rome and the Roman Empire with the influence of Christianity now starting to spread. According to theologian Marvin Vincent, Roman slaves were considered property, and he writes, tracking fugitive slaves was a trade. Recovered slaves were branded on the forehead, condemned to double labor, and sometimes thrown to the beasts in the amphitheater. And the slave population was enormous. Thus, viewing a runaway slave as a beloved brother is a radical departure from the norm of that society, even though his crime was deserving of death. Now, when Adam and Eve turned away from their creator, their master, they too had committed a crime against God, worthy of death. Every time that you and I sin, we are turning and we're running away from God, going our own way against His will. And we deserve nothing but, and we confess this, temporal and eternal punishment. We know that our sin is deserving of death, for the wages of sin is death. Believe me, Paul understood where Onesimus was at in relationship to his master, Philemon. Because Paul was in that same place at one time, remember? When he was persecuting the church of Christ, he was deserving of nothing but death and punishment for his crime against Jesus and for the, against the church. And like Onesimus, Paul comes to recognize his sin. He comes to faith in Jesus Christ. As Jesus speaks to him himself, he comes to know Christ Jesus as his Lord, as his master and savior. And Paul becomes a servant, no longer to, to sin or a slave to sin, but a servant to Christ because of what Christ has done for him. And he always says over and over in all of his letters, it's, <laughs> it's by grace, it's by mercy that I am where I am now and who I am. No longer a slave to sin, but restored into a family where we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul writes this letter to Philemon, standing between him and his slave Onesimus. And he pleads with Philemon. He pleads as a father would plead for his son. That's how close Paul became in his relationship with Onesimus. He even calls himself his spiritual father. And he's pleading for him to take him back, not as a slave, but as a brother. He writes, I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. And if he's wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I will repay it. Paul wants him to receive Onesimus back as one who is now useful to him, not as a useless slave who's run away, but now as a useful brother in Christ who could be a wonderful gift to the church there in Colossae, one who has been made righteous just as Philemon has in Christ. Christ. 
This picture of Paul pleading to Philemon to forgive his slave and to take him back as a brother should sound familiar. Because it's similar to the work that our Lord Jesus Christ does on our behalf to our Creator, our Heavenly Father. You see, Jesus is our advocate. He is pleading with His Father to forgive us of our crime against Him and all of our sin. Instead of offering to repay for our sins, as Paul did with Philemon, Jesus actually does pay. He pays a price higher than any cost in this world with His holy blood and His innocent suffering and death. Jesus redeems us, which literally means to buy us back. And He purchases us back to His Father in heaven. Through his death and resurrection, he pleads to the Father in heaven to have mercy upon us, to have show grace to us, and to take us back forever, not as a slave, but as one who is a redeemed child, who is now a brother and a sister to others in Christ Jesus. A runaway slave was useless to Philemon, but after Onesimus had been with Paul and he came to faith in Jesus Christ, he becomes a new man in Christ himself. He's no longer the old slave. He is now a new man, a new brother in Christ. And now about the play on words with Onesimus, who is now useful, because Paul was trying to make that point that Onesimus who is useful, (laughs) whose name is useful, can be useful to you now. And so he writes, he says, I I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed Onesimus. He is useful to you and to me. At one time, we were not living as people of God. At one time, we were useless slaves to sin. But because of what Christ has done by bringing mercy and grace of God into our lives, God can now see us as ones who do works of righteousness for Christ's sake. Have you ever walked around a you know, the farm back in the day and, uh, you know, go through some of the sheds and outbuildings and barns and so forth. And uh, I remember one time, you know, running across this big pile of old discarded tools. And in that big pile of junk (laughs) was this post hole digger. And if you've seen a post hole digger that has not been used in years and been just left laying around, it doesn't work very well. In fact, the wood rots on it. You can't even use it to, to pry it apart. It's rusty. And that's why I was on this pile, I'm sure. But if you take that post hole digger and you replace the wood on it with new wooden handles and you take the rust and you clean it off and you sharpen it up, you oil it up a little bit, it can be useful again. And I thought to myself, you know, what a beautiful picture this is of us, because that's exactly what God does with us. He takes us, He cleans us, He scrapes us, He oils us, replaces the rottenness in our lives, the useless and discarded garbage of sin. He gets rid of it and makes makes us useful. Because of the enormity of his love, he picks us up in his hands, hands that once were nailed to the wood of the cross, and he starts to use us again for his purposes. If God, through Jesus Christ, could take formerly useless people like Paul and Philemon and Onesimus 
and make them into useful instruments of His grace, I think He can still do the same today with us. And He does. God in Jesus takes formerly useless, sinful people like you and me, and He makes us into useful instruments of His grace in our world today. You know, there's many times where Paul wrote trying to help us understand that movement from being a useless slave to sin to a very useful instrument of God who become brothers in Christ in the family of God. I want to, I want to read to you one of those instances when he wrote to his friend Titus. In chapter 3, he said, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various types of passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and the kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. In Jesus Christ, we have been bought back. We have become now these heirs these brothers and sisters in Christ because of the grace of our God. And now we can look forward because of what God has done, taking us back (laughs) as His beloved children to enjoy an eternal presence with Him. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all human understanding keep our hearts and our minds always in Christ Jesus. Amen.